real pleasure, and uh, it's uh, I think really also important to discuss the, the OPRA data. We are in the field of rectal cancer, and it's not just the, the low risk tumors, the small ones, but you went in this trial quite far up with the um, the nodal and, and T stage, uh, and you offered those patients organ preservation, although a substantial part of these patients. And uh, I think this is in a way a game changer, uh, and uh, you know it will in a way also influence our daily discussions. And in rectal cancer, the discussions they become really uh, intensive now. The two more we have to allocate more time for these patients because yeah. uh, everybody is kind of uh, really intensely discussing what's going to happen with this patient. So we have here a group of uh, we're just finishing our tumor board, our local tumor board, and we, we just discussed about the uh, ten to twelve cases, and now we are ready to listen to your uh, presentation and then of course we would like to discuss how you do handle these cases now thank you very much for joining my pleasure is thank you for the invite it's a pleasure to be with you today so i'm going to share my my screen see if i can find the presentations and um yeah i'm gonna tell you a little bit uh, about the 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 opera trial which is very much the way we approach uh, you know, the organ preservation in patients with uh, rectal cancer. I will just start by saying that the idea of just treating rectal cancer with radiation alone is not, is not new. Uh, it has been around for over a hundred years when surgery was very morbid at the beginning of the 20th century and natural radiation became available at MSK radiation was the primary way to treat rectal cancer and surgery was just a salvage. This is just the the first chief of the colorectal service at MSK in the 1920s. And you can read in this paper in the Annals of Surgery that, you know, a memorial, we prefer the radiation therapy. Let me just, this is on timing. As the principal factor for the treatment of rectal cancer, it was supplemented with surgery when radiation didn't work. Of course, what happened with time, surgery became safer. And we also discovered the side effects of radiation. That's the reason why the pendulum went from radiation to surgery. And for many years, kind of, you know, the idea of watch and wait with radiation kind of disappeared because uh, surgery became safer. I think it was just probably over 20 years ago that Angelita Bragama in Brazil started to put this idea back again. It really never disappeared, but she just put that in the main, um, you know, page of all the journals with this paper that published in 2004 when she compared patients that had received patients with relatively advanced rectal cancer, we didn't know the stage at that time, but patients with rectal cancer treated with radiation that had a complete response, she compared the outcome with patients, similar patients treated with the chemo radiation who had TME and had a pathological complete response. So what she found that the co clinical complete responders observed had similar outcome that the patient who got a pathological complete response after TME. So this paper kind of showed that the deferral of surgery was safe. Surgical salvage for the patient who got tumor regrowth was effective and long-term survival with watch and wait was possible. This, this experience has been replicated in many different institutions across the world. And a, a few years ago, there was this kind of pool uh, analysis of data from you know 180 patients that they have been putting watch and wait at 47 centers, 25 different countries over you know 25 years. The experience showed that you know in the panel in the left that of the patient who went into watch and wait, approximately 25 percent of them had tumor regrowth. Um, one in four, the tumor came back. Uh, but the survival was good because many of them were salvaged with TME. So the problem with this data was the common data of all the retrospective data when you only take the patient who had watch and wait. The denominator was unknown. We, we didn't know where those patients came from. The criteria for inclusions, they were you know, not uniform. The neoadjuvant regimens were variable. So some patients were treated with radiation, some patients with chemoradiation circle radiation, all possible um, combinations. There was no information of when the response was assessed. There was no defined criteria to, the, to say what is a response and what is not, because that's quite important when you want to extrapolate and, and apply this data in different uh, you know, institutions throughout the world. You know, the criteria for assessing the response was, again, not uniform and even the methodology. 
the surveillance protocol, how the patient were followed was also very variable. They were no pathological proof of tumor regrowth. And there was, you know, the salvage was variable. Some, pay, some sites, they did um, local excision. Some sites, they did the TME. It was, you know, very difficult. So there were still a number of controversies in watch and wait. You know, how many patients will benefit? Because again, we didn't know the denominator from those retrospective case areas. You know, how well, how best selects the, pa the patient for watch and wait? You know, should we attempt organ preservation in patients who got a perfect response or less than a perfect response, what we call near complete response? And then also we didn't know what the results of cerebral surgery were when you just did these studies kind of in a prospective way. So, you know, when we, you know, 15 years ago or so started to, you know, think about the idea of designing a trial to study organ preservation, of course, this would be the ideal study design. Patient with this rectal cancer treated with optimal nevagulant therapy, then we will do re-staging with digital rectal exam, endoscopy, and MRI. So patient without clinical complete response will have surgery, and patient with complete response, we will randomize to, you know, watch and wait or TME. I mean, the hypothesis will be that watch and wait will be equivalent to TME for complete responders. Of course, this design is not feasible because at least in the United States, patient with a clinical complete response, you know, will not agree to that randomization. So when we design the OPRA trial, we design kind of a practical approach. We had an investigation alarm in which we allow watch and wait for patients with complete response and compare the results with historical controls. Patients with similar stage that have been treated with chemoradiation, TME, and postoperative adjuvant chemotherapy. And the hypothesis was that incorporating watch and wait for complete response will not cause a decrease in disease-free survival. The survival will be the same, and the benefit of the trial will be that some patients will have organ preservation. So this was the study design. Again, patients with distal rectal cancer were treated with PNT, which was the kind of the new kit on the block. Um, then they were restaged between eight, not nine or four weeks after finishing total invasive therapy. Patients with visual tumor. So patients with complete or near complete response, we offer them watch and wait. So this was the, the protocol. Now, because at our institution, there were some uh, people who prefer chemoradiation followed by chemotherapy, other prefer chemotherapy followed by chemoradiation, we introduced a randomization of, uh, you know, chemotherapy first versus uh, radiation first. But all patients then at the end of total nevagivant therapy, approximately um, you know, eight weeks after the completion of the nevagivant therapy, whatever regimen they, they were included, then we did the re-staging and then is when we made the decision. Um, you know, here it's important also to emphasize that we offer watch and wait to patients with complete response and also to patients who had what we call near complete response. And again, we compare the results in terms of disease-free survival with historical controls. Again, the hypothesis was that allowing watch and wait will not cause detriment in disease-free survival. In fact, it will improve disease-free survival because we were using TNT. So again, the primary endpoint was disease-free survival. And uh, the secondary endpoint was compare the organ preservation between patients who receive radiation first versus patients who receive chemotherapy first. Of course, we have many other uh, secondary uh, you know, outcomes, such as quality of life, complications, compliance, and all those things. And for the study, we included patients that they were 18 years of older. They had to have proven adenocarcinoma, clinical stage 2, stage 3 by MRI. This is what most rectal cancer studies have included in the past. It's a little different, for example, than Rapido, who had slightly more advanced tumors. And they all had to be distal. This was different than other studies. These were two more that they would require either an APR or a coloenal anastomosis. And we'll see what was the average distance from the anal verge. Now, for systemic chemotherapy, um, all of them received four months of chemotherapy, either Folfox or Kpox. We consider them equivalent um, in terms of you know, the efficacy. 
all patients receive radiation therapy at the doses that we um, present there. The maximal dose was 56 um, grays. And then during the radiation, we use sensitizing chemotherapy, either continuous infusion, 5-FU, or oral capsidabine. I can tell you that for the systemic chemotherapy, 75% of the patient had four folks, 25 approximately have K-pox. We haven't seen any difference between them. Um, for sensitizing chemotherapy, capsidabine was more common than continuous infusion, 5-FU. The dose of radiation, as I will show, were very, very similar in both groups. There were no difference in the total dose of radiation or in the compliance with the treatment. The compliance was very good with the systemic chemotherapy and the radiation in both groups. Um, it was quite high as expected with total neoadjuvant therapy. Now, what we did for the study was define these three grades of response. You know, in the far right is what we call an incomplete response. It doesn't mean that the tumor had not responded. What it means is that when we look with the uh, endoscopy or with the MRI, we still see tumor there, even though the tumor might have responded 70% or, or 80%, but there is a still visible tumor there. That's what we call an incomplete response. In the other end of the spectrum, we have what we call a clinical complete response. Very nice scar. There is no nodularity. There is no superficial ulceration. That's the ideal response. And then by MRI, a perfect scar, no restricted diffusion. Now we include this category of near complete a response, and you have an example there, a tumor that had a little bit of a scar left at the time of the assessment of the response, eight weeks after TNT, we call that a near complete response. And then, you know, in digital rectal exam is multi duration. In, in T2, the scar was not perfect. And maybe on DWI, there was a little bit of restricted diffusions. And the idea to introduce this group and allow initial watch and wait on them was to give them more time for them to respond. Again, in the follow-up, and you will see that in the next slide, we recommended uh, in the first two years do endoscopy and, uh, and digital rectal exam and CEA three times a year, MRI twice a year, and then CT scan and colonoscopy uh, you know, every year. In years three, four, and, and five, we went to every six months. Now. I have to mention that patients with near complete response, sometimes we saw them more frequently. If I had a patient with near complete response at completion of the neoadjuvant therapy, pretty often I call them and I ask them to come back six weeks as opposed to four months, four months, because we want to make sure that the near complete response is turning into a complete response and not into a progression. So, you know, the clinical complete responder, we, you know, felt confidence, they come back in four months. The patient with incomplete response went to the OR. The patient with near complete response, sometimes they came to see us again six weeks later. And at that point, he, we saw that that superficial ulcer had healed and the tumor is gone. We continue watch and wait according to the standard protocol. But he, we saw that the tumor was not, you know, progressing. Again, it was not responding more the response kind of stalled or started to grow back again, those patients went to the operating room. But initially, even the near complete responder, we offered there the possibility of watch and wait. And again, this is the surveillance protocol. You have seen it in our paper published, very standard now in people doing watch and wait. Again, digital rectal exam, flexible semidoscopy, CEA every four months, and the MRI we do you know, twice a year because it's more expensive and the insurance company not always were willing to pay more than that. And then the other uh, follow-up is very standard per guidelines. Now, these are the characteristics of the patient that we included in the study. We have 158 in one group, 166 in the other. Age, gender, more males. The T classification, you have it there. There were a few T1s, T2s, and not positive. There were also T4s. Most of the patients had positive lymph nodes, again, according to the MRI. And as you can see, the distal from the analverse they were relatively low tumors. The average distance was 4.3, 4.5 uh, centimeters from the anal verge. And, you know, the grade, it was that. Uh, at the time when we accrued patients in this study, we were not doing anything with MSI tumors. So this includes a few MSI tumors because the protocol that I will mention later, it was open after this protocol was closed. Now, these are the what happened at, at the end of the uh, neoadjuvant therapy eight weeks later 
These are the proportion of patients in this table who originally went into watch and wait. We recommend the watch and wait in 72% of the patients in the induction group, the one who received chemotherapy first, and 76% of the patients who receive radiation first and then chemotherapy. Now, then you follow what happened with those patients, those who developed tumor regrowth represented in that graph. Patients who received radiation first followed by chemotherapy had less probability of developing a regrowth and requiring TME during the follow-up. The patients who received chemotherapy first were more likely to um, uh, require um, uh, you know, mesorectal excision during follow-up. And, and I think this is interesting because when we saw differences between the two different arms, radiation first versus chemo first, some people thought that that was because the time from the end of radiation was different in both groups. But this data argues against that because, you know, the proportion of patients going into watch and wait was similar at the beginning. It's only later when patients who got received chemotherapy first develop regrowth. So, you know, we, we don't know why we were different. The fact of the matter is that at the end of the day, when we analyze by intention to treat, 53% um, of patients in the radiation first group achieve sustained organ preservation versus 41% in the group that they have induction. Now, the protocol recommended that patients with incomplete response or tumor regrowth during watch and wait had TME but there were four protocol violation, violations in each arm. Four patients that they were supposed to have TME, refused TME, and they had local excision. So in the panel in the left, in the intention to treat, they are counted as TMEs. In the panel in the right, those patients are not counted um, as TMEs. So the actual rate of avoiding TME was even greater than you know, the intention to treat. I, I don't know if this graph is clear enough. What we are representing here is the proportion of patients who kept the rectum and were alive. So the events are TME or death from any cause. So what we represent there again is proportion of patients who, you know, had TME and of course were alive. I mean, you know, TME free and were alive. So, you know, it was 53% in intention to treat, almost 60% when we really count all the patients who avoided the TME. So the, the numbers were surprising even to us. Now, you know, the fact that we found greater response rate in radiation first versus chemotherapy first, were not surprising. You are familiar probably with this uh, trial, the CAO-12 trial from Germany. They have randomized patients to the same approach, induction chemotherapy followed by chemoradiation versus chemoradiation followed by consolidation chemotherapy. In this trial, they only use three cycles of full FOX. In our study, we use eight and, you know, much longer um, uh, treatment. In their case, the PCR rate was 25 in the radiation first versus 17% in the induction first. Suggests that probably starting with radiation leads to more response and greater organ preservation. And, and I, as I mentioned before, I believe that that is not only related to the time between the end on radiation and the assessment of the response. There is probably something biological in there because our data do not support that. Now, when it comes to disease-free survival, Two, the two arms in our trial had exactly the same, 76%. Originally, we have hypothesized that because we were using TNT and our historical control had a DFS of 75%, that our DFS will be greater than 80%. But that would turn out not to be true. Our survival rate DFS was only 76%, which it was very similar to the historical control. And as you can see here, is within the range of other rectal cancer trials that they have used different neoadjuvant regimen. This kind of puts a little bit of a question about the, the really the added benefit of TNT in terms of you know overall survival. The the CAO twelve trial that had similar um, um, you know characteristics and similar um, stays than our patients was also you know seventy three percent. So. The survival, the disease-free survival, even though we use TNT, still was only um, you know, 76%, 25% of the patients develop either metastasis or tumor recurrence. Now, when we look at the local recurrent rate, this is not regrowth. These are patients who either had unsalvageable regrowth, regrowth that couldn't be removed with an R0 resection, 
or patient who had a local recurrence after an R0 resection. Our local recurrence rate is you know, parallel to other trials in, in rectal cancer. The distal metastasis rate also similar to other studies, approximately 20, 20, you know, 1%. And again, both were similar in both arms. So the, the only difference that we saw between the arms uh, was the, the rate of response and organ preservation. And this is something that was in our hypothesis. We have done previous studies and we have found that giving chemotherapy after chemo radiation was probably more conducive to um, response than starting with induction chemotherapy. Now, this is the pathology for the, for the patients who require TME. Again, um, surgery was performed in the number that you have there. Uh, as I mentioned before, there were kind of eight protocol violations, four in each uh, arm because they didn't have TME, they had transanal excision. We still observe some pathological complete responses. That suggests that sometimes we take patients to the operating room, you know, suspecting that there is tumor there and then we are wrong. You know, the tumor is already gone. So we still have problems with identifying responders in both directions. We underestimate a response in some cases like this, and then we overestimate it in others. Patients that we think that they had, um, a, you know, a tumor there and, and uh, excuse me, they, they, they have a complete response and then they have tumor regrowth. So we still have difficulty, even with endoscopy, MRI and everything, to really separate the respondents from non-responders. And as I say, it goes in both directions. Um, most patients had an R0 resection, patients who require a TME either just after the uh, completion of the neoadjuvant therapy because the tumor was still there or um, for patients who had the tumor regrowth. The rate of uh, you know, R0 resection was almost 90% in both groups. Now, one of the we made a comparison that is published in the um, supplemental material, which it was compare the survival of patients who required TME immediately after finishing, TNT, finishing TNT, because they have what we call persistent tumor, those were the incomplete responders, and we compare the survival with those who required TME later on during the follow-up because they develop what we call tumor regrowth. Of course, the numbers, you know. They, they don't show any statistical difference because then because the numbers are, are, are small. I mean, 69 in one group, 61 in the other. But the curve separate a little bit, which kind of make us think that maybe with the regrowth, we are missing some cases that maybe we get too late to the salvage. And, and that emphasized the importance of following these patients very closely. And, you know, if you see that there is any signs of the tumor progressing, get them to the operating room. The, the other thing that we did was looking at the rate of local recurrence. And of course, the rate of local recurrence for the patient who got TME is higher than what you would expect with other trials that they don't offer TME when all the patients had, uh, they didn't offer watch and wait when all patients had TME. What, what we are doing with the, with the watch and wait, here we are selecting patients with good biology. So the one that they end up going to the operating room, they are the bad player, the one that don't respond to chemotherapy radiation. So we, <clears throat> we see worse oncological outcomes. And when you look at the rate of local recurrence, it's a little bit high. I mean, it's in one group, you know, in the patient who had the um, re-staging, uh, TME are re-staging immediately after finishing TNT is 14%. But in patient who had TME after local regrowth is 25%. So I, I think this is important to emphasize that the tumor that do not respond and they require TME are a high risk group. And we're gonna see that in the next slides. Um, also because this tumor were low, the rate of APR is probably higher than in other series that include patients throughout the rectum. We only include lower rectal cancers. Now, as, as I mentioned in the design of the trial, um, at the end of TNT, Eight weeks later, we restage the tumor and we had the three groups, complete response, near complete response, incomplete response. In complete response, TME, um, complete or near complete response, we allow watch and wait with follow-up being closer or a little bit more relaxed depending on the degree of response. So what we decided in this uh, um, analysis was to look at what happened with the patient who had the optimal response, the near complete response and the incomplete response. So we look at the tumor characteristics, there were no dramatic differences. So there is nothing in the 
usual clinical parameters that is going to predict who is going to respond or not. But we look at what was the probability of keeping the rectum if you have complete, near complete, or, in, or incomplete response. Of course, the incomplete response, they all had the rectum removed because the protocol required it that they all had the rectum removed. Um, but both the complete and near complete were offered watch and wait. So what happened long term is that the patient who got the perfect response, a white scar, no nodularity, no ulceration, the probability of keeping the rectum was almost 75%. So could you have a very good response that what happened, 75%. If the response is less than ideal, is near complete, it's a little bit less than 50%. But still, half of the patient with near complete response, they still achieve organ preservation. In the panel to my right, um, to the right of the screen, is what was the probability of tumor regrowth during watch and wait? If the patient initially had a complete clinical response in kind of orange, or near complete response. Of course, of the near complete responders, almost half of them require TME. And usually it's also in the first four years. It's not like they develop regrowth three or four years down the line. It's usually, if you follow a patient with a near complete response and you follow them closely, the tumor is gonna declare itself within the first year or two from the end of TNT. Now, the other thing that we found is that the degree of clinical response at the time of assessment, eight weeks after TNT, predicted survival very well. This is DFS. So the patient who did the worst are the one who had immediate surgery right after finishing TNT. Why? Because the biology, the worst. I mean, you know, they don't have a good response. So they are the, they do worse. The intermediate responder were the patient who got a near complete response. Uh, and the best patient, the one that did the best in terms of DFS, are the ones at the top that most of them had no surgery, but still they are the ones who do the best because probably they have good biology. I think what this data shows is that the clinical response is a very good predictor. The clinical response right at the end of TNT is a very good predictor of what is going to happen long term, so whether you do surgery or not. Because again, most patients in the red line kept the rectum, more patients in the blue line had the rectum removed. And if you look at these survival curves, in patients who were treated with neoadjuvant therapy and had TME, and then analyze the outcome based on the pathology, whether the, you know, the um, T stage or the tumor regression grade, they were two different series, one from the MD Anderson, the other one from the German trial. The pathology stratifies the response very well, similar to our data. Our clinical complete response stratifies disease-free survival, stratifies local recurrence, and stratifies distal metastasis, which tell us that clinical response at the end of TNT is a very good predictor of what happened. This is data, again, from Germany. Again, pathological response in patients treated with chemoradiation and total mesorectal excision is very similar to what we see with clinical complete response. So, you know, clinical complete response is a very good predictor of what is going to happen to the patients. And that's the reason why we take advantage. And in the patient who got a perfect response, we can just watch them and, and avoid surgery, you know, preserving the rectum. So, I mean, I think that is some of the conclusion that we have got from the, uh, from the OPRA trial. Now, since the OPRA trial, for a number of reasons, we started to explore the use of checkpoint blockade in MSI rectal cancer. Now, the proportion of, of um, MSI in the rectum is very small. It's probably around 4%. But still, it's a group that we have observed in the past, and we have published on that um, a finding, that patients with MSI tumor in the rectum responded very poorly to chemotherapy first. They responded okay to radiation, but they responded poorly to chemotherapy. And we have some cases of uh, not so good outcomes when patients were started with induction chemotherapy. So that led us to study the um, possibility of using immune, I mean, checkpoint blockade in the neoadjuvant setting in patients with a stage two or stage three rectal cancer. And again, only much uh, repair, um, you know, MMR deficient. And, you know, we designed this trial that with the idea of enrolling 30 patients. And the idea was that patients with, the, with um, this rectal cancer treated with uh, 
immune check from blockade, they will have a clinical complete response and they will avoid uh, um, radiation or chemotherapy or surgery. Um, so we, we did the sample cycle calculation. Andrea Cerce, one of the oncologists, were leading this study. And to our surprise, what we found is that all the patients had a clinical complete response. This is the data presented this summer at ASCO and published in the New England Journal of Medicine in June. At the time, we had good follow-up in 14 patients. This is the, the follow-up um, of the patients where they were, uh, you know, in, in the follow-up after having completed the six months of uh, immune check plan blockade. I think today we have 29, maybe I put in the trial patient 28 a month ago or so, so we might be getting to the 30 patients. And so far, all of them, they have responded and we haven't seen any tumor regrowth. So this is very, very promising for, again, for the small group of patients that they have MSI tumor. So today we don't start treatment of rectal cancer without knowing the uh, MMR status of the tumor, because we think that it's very important to treat those patients with um, you know, immune checkpoint blockade. Of course, we don't know what is gonna happen long-term. Um, we need to have longer follow-up, but so far, some patients are already um, in the three-year mark. We, ha we have seen no regrowth. Um, so I think I can summarize and then we can just talk about this, uh, You know, have some questions. What we have learned from the OPRA trial is that the rate of rectal cancer response to chemoradiation is much higher than um, we ever thought it was. And the, and the reason is that in this trial, we have given the tumors time to respond. Um, we have allowed you know, the entire TNT, which takes over six months um, of the total treatment. Then we give them another eight weeks. And then even the near complete responder, we give them the opportunity to continue responding with a very close um, uh, surveillance. You know, rectal cancer response takes time in some cases, you know, it takes from the beginning of treatment to the time where they really accomplish the, the response 100%, it, it might take almost one year. I think we still have some problem with underestimating and overestimating response because, you know, eight, 9% of the patients that we take to the operating room thinking that they have cancer, they have PCR. And again, 25% of the patient that we put in watch and wait, they have tumor regular. And, you know, Again, as I mentioned before, almost half of the patients with a near complete response at the assessment, they ended achieving organ preservation. Um, <clears throat> the, the oncological outcomes of the patient with near complete response are somewhere in between the complete responders and uh, incomplete responders, which are the ones that they do worse in terms of DFS. Um, salvage surgery seems to provide equivalent survival, but we have to keep in mind that when we compare patients who had salvo surgery immediately after um, you know, TNT versus the one that they require later on during follow-up, yeah. numbers are small. And I think we would like to have more experience and longer follow-up to make sure that you know, we are not hurting some patient by just putting them for too long in watch and wait. The, the idea of local excision, which many surgeons are now advocating for tumor that they have you know, near complete response, is something that we have not explored. My personal feeling is that the tumor that don't achieve a clinical complete response um, to neoadjuvant therapy are a selected group of tumor with a more aggressive biology. That's the reason why they don't respond. So a local excision might be risking some of them because again, this tumor might have a more aggressive biology and more um, likely to come back if you don't do a complete mesorectal excision. So that's something that this is still debatable. Um, again, the, the trial was designed to improve the FS with TNT and, and watch and wait, but what we have seen is that with TNT and watch and wait, we get the same survival that we did with historical control. But what I must say is that the survival that we observed, the 76% DFS at three years, is within the range of other clinical trials that they have um, treated you know, similar uh, patients. So we believe that we are not hurting, um, at least we are not hurting patients. So I think this is the conclusion that, you know, a treatment strategy that includes TNT and selective watch and wait allows for organ preservation in half of the patients. And this is what we observe in our practice outside the trial. We have probably hundreds of patients now in watch and wait. I think most patients now accept the idea of watch and wait. Many patients come to the institution demanding, you know, they come here because they have heard that we do watch and wait and they want to explore that. So I think it should be part of the treatment discussion because patients now are very well informed about the pathological complete response, et cetera. And he does not discuss um, 
uh, you know, before starting, I mean, not before starting treatment, at least at the end of treatment, if the patient had a clinical complete response, might create problems with the patient. But I think it's important to emphasize that in order to put a patient in watch and wait, you have to make sure that the patient is going to be compliant with follow-up because still we have a 25% risk of tumor regrowth and that can be a tragic if the patients are not willing to come to be examined and have the flexible simidoscopy and the MRI at the time that they are supposed to come to do that. So it requires a good understanding and you know a patient that is willing to come. So that's what we have learned from the OPRA trial. I will be happy to you know, address any questions and, and, and talk about the results. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This was a really a nice, a very nice presentation. And I think it's really worthwhile to discuss this. You already said that you have changed your practice to do it like it was done in this trial. You also mentioned that it is difficult to do the ideal trial and that you already have been adopted based on that knowledge and recommend to patients that organ preservation is really now possible also in, in, in advanced tumors. Uh, in more advanced tumors. So um, I actually quite understand the way forward. For me, it's quite clear. I think what you also said regarding the, all, the, the willing patient, the suitable patient is important. You know, they need to be informed. Our follow-up schema here in Switzerland is a little bit more, even tighter. We, we do have more regular controls. We, we just uh, uh, published a guideline for the Swiss patients where we do three monthly checks with MRI and endoscopy, really, it's really a kind of a tight control. Yeah. So that's, I think also we are safe on that side. And uh, we also now include the patients in the watch and international watch and wait database. So we will see and learn from that. We just started with that. So no, I think it's fine for me. I'm quite clear, but probably the more critical voices well, here, I'd like to hand over the microphone. Let me emphasize what you say is very important. I mean, you do every three months. I think uh, in my practice, I kind of customize a little bit how soon I see them, as I mentioned. When I see a patient who, because you know, what happened with the TNT is that we don't, we don't kind of discuss the patient that you, know, you are gonna go into watch and wait or not. When, they, when we start treatment, we say, okay, we're gonna give you treatment there is a 50-50 chance that the tumor will go away. When the tumor, when we see the response, we talk about watch and wait. It's not something that we can offer sort of, you know, you say it's an option, but, but we don't emphasize too much. And then what we do at MSK, imagine for example, the patient start with chemo radiation. I do a flexible simidoscopy at the end of chemo radiation before they start chemo. So I have a pretty good idea how the tumor is responding. He they start with systemic chemotherapy at the beginning when we didn't have that much experience with many years ago with the, with the induction chemotherapy, and we were not sure whether the tumor was going to respond or not. We will do two months of full FOX. We will do a flexic. Then we'll do two months of the other two months of full FOX. They will do a flexic. So we have seen how the tumor is responding. So when we go to the eight weeks after the TNT, um, either, you know, the track of that response is very good and the tumor is completely gone, I can say then come back in four months. But if I see that you know, the response is, is great, but you know, then I ask them sometimes to come in six weeks. So I think three months probably reasonable, uh, you know, average. So, you know, I think I customize a little bit because, you know, we have been doing this thing for a while and, you know, sometimes just, okay, there is a little bit of ulceration, that tumor might go away, the patient is very interested, it's a very distal rectal cancer, might require an APR if I take him now. So I might rather just wait a little bit and I have them to come in six weeks. So I think that requires some common sense. Okay. Hello, my name is Jan from, I'm here from Zurich. I'm from surgery. And um, I have a question. Uh, if, I, if I understood your presentation correct, you said 50% of all the patients that have had total knee advent treatment had preserved their rectum at the end of the observation period. That's true? Correct, yes. Okay, and the follow-up of these patients that the rectum was preserved, how long was that and how many late recurrences did you see? Well, the recurrences are there in the, in the, um, in the curves, in the, you know, organ preserve. Most of the regrowths or, or the patient that we put into watch and wait, um, you saw the curves of the regrowth, most of them occur within the, the first two years. Okay, all, all of the, the regrowths occur within the first two years. Now, 
the other day for the first time, we have been doing watch and wait longer than when we started the trial. And I have patients that we have been following for eight, nine years. Mm -hmm. The other day for the first time, I saw a patient that um, I, I, we treated with TNT in 2013. She was not part of the protocol because the protocol didn't open until 14, 15. That patient, I follow her with routine follow-ups as according to our protocol, which is the same one that we had in the trial until 2019. 2020, she was already six years out and stopped coming because of the COVID. And she showed up this year with a regrowth, a tumor coming back. We yes. profiled the tumor and we profiled the original tumor molecularly. We have a homegrown molecular assay and the tumor seems to be the same. So is the longer regrowth that we have seen in our practice so far, nine years. I mean, you also see local recurrences after TME and nine years, but this is the longer one that we have seen. Most of the regrowths of the patient that you put in follow-up occur during the first two years um, and very few after that. Um, you know, again, in the study, we have five years. We are getting to the five years of follow-up this year. We will be publishing an update. In our practice, we have patients that they have gone 10 years into watch and wait and we haven't seen uh, regrowths. You know, most of them occur early on. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question. What's your position with the rectal cancers in the mid third and in the upper third? In the, I mean, you know, organ preservation is important when you have a distal rectal cancer. I mean, a, an upper rectal cancer organ preservation doesn't make much sense. You can do a TME, preserve a portion of the rectum. So the benefit of organ preservation is really for tumors in the low distal rectum. Um, you know, a patient in the upper rectum sometimes we have a different approach. Very often, we use the approach of the, of the prospect trial. It hasn't been published yet, but the idea came here from MSK. In those patients, sometimes we start with systemic chemotherapy, um, and then we look at the response to systemic chemotherapy. Sometimes we go to the operating room without radiation. Sometimes we give them radiation. Some upper rectal cancer don't even need any neoadjuvant therapy. You can if the circumferential margins are negative and they don't look too advanced, you just can do, even if they are stage three, you can just do TME. So um, the treatment of rectal cancer has to be customized to the stage of the tumor, the location of the tumor, the age of the patient, the comorbidities, what are the expectation, you know, what do they want to do? Some patients, they say, I won't have surgery no matter what. Some people say, I won't have radiation no matter what. So I think it's, you have to customize, but the benefit of organ preservation is mainly for patients who require an APR or a very low coloena. Okay. And then, of course, we have at last, uh, this is my last question, a lively discussion about a possible boost if you don't see a complete response, like yep. a below technique. Maybe uh, does that play a role in your uh, setting or also? What do you think about? In general, we don't, but occasionally, I, I mean, boost, you're talking about boost. Uh, like endocavitary radiation or or external beam? Yeah, there are two kinds. I mean, uh, Christina, perhaps you can uh, go ahead because we have the radiation oncologist here. We, 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 we do two kinds of techniques, you know, so just for me, the classical boost, so we just put some more boost on it. That's for the oncologist. <laughs> and the other one is the papillon technique. This is the papillon. Yeah, yeah this is, yeah. we have it here and, and our radiation oncologist is, Really uh, happy to use it, and she mastered it uh, really well. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, in terms of external beam radiation, we use, for the most part, IMRT, and we go to 56 uh, grades, okay? Now, boost, we haven't been using them routinely. Um, right now, I'm still, you know, with my clothes coming from the operating room. I just finished an APR in a patient who precisely had a distal rectal cancer, required an APR, didn't respond completely, and didn't want to have an APR. So he got um, endocavitary radiation, not the papillon, because we don't have it in our institution, and didn't respond either. So we do it occasionally, but we don't do as a routine. Now, Jean-Pierre Gerard was here with us this past weekend. We had a, a small symposium. Jean-Pierre Gerard from, from Lyon has used the endocavitary radiation to boost after external beam radiation, and he has presented, his trial is called OPERA, O-P-E-R-A. Um, and he had used, he had used uh, endocavitary radiation to increase the response, and he had reported a better response, but I think his tumor were a little bit earlier stage. So it's feasible, but we don't use it routinely. Then that's what I can summarize.
Okay. Christina, question? First, thank you very much for the excellent presentation and for the trial. I think this trial was absolutely needed. I don't think there are a lot of um, organ preservation, but the prospective data were missing. And I was so happy when you started the trial and you published the, the preliminary results two years ago. So back to the radiation and to the dose. We have learned from your trial or from previous trial that the response, the local response after the treatment is correlated with our results. So you have to have a good local response to have a good late response. And the radiation dose is clearly correlated with your response. So what you can manage with external beam is 50 gray. If you are really courageous, you can get 55, 56, 58, but no way. Even with modern technique, even if you have daily imaging, you can give the dose radiation because biological studies demonstrate that if you want to sterilize rectal cancer, you need around 90 gray. Yeah. The idea to add a boost is excellent when actually the study you mentioned and Angelina for 20 years, she boosted, but she boosted with six, eight grades. That's, that's peanut. So yeah. to the tumor, a high dose of the papillons, the way to do it, because you have 50 kV, you have low dose energy, but that puts yeah. your tumor. So you can treat locally the tumor in few centimeters. You have a huge possibility to have a local control. And if you compare the data, of course, there are 50 machines worldwide. You can have prospective data, you can have randomized trial, but you compare the data from Jean Pierre or from San Mint in England, also performing a lot of conservative treatment, you can clearly see that response, the local relapse, sorry, is falling from 30% to 11%. So I yeah. think that if you will treat your patients that are in near complete response or either who have T2, T3 tumors adding a boost, this rate of around 70%, uh, sorry, 30% that didn't respond, I'm sure you will have better results. It, I, I totally agree, it's possible. I mean, the, you know, the problem with the machines, the, the old, you know, Philips machine, they stopped making it. When I was uh, young, I, I used to work in Minnesota and we had it. Uh, we use it only for very early stage tumor because the limitation was the diameter of the machine, which was three centimeters. It still is one of the limitations. Some of the tumor that we have in the Oprah trial, they were quite large. Some of the tumor were even circumferential. But for, for these areas of near complete response, probably it's a very good technique. And if the patient is really motivated to preserve the rectum, I think it's definitely an alternative. Um, I don't think that we have any machine in the United States right now. And um, the, the, the technique that we use is just, you know, like a proctoscope type of with the wires and, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the more conventional radiation therapy. I know the radiation oncologists, but, but I, I, you know, the, I don't think that there are many machines of, uh, you know, the new machine that, you know, the Papillon machine that they have been designed recently in the United States. And as I say, we had here Jean-Pierre Gerard this weekend and presented the data. And uh, I think it's very compelling. Yeah, now we have around, I think, 15 machines worldwide and uh, no other, only two machines in the USA. And uh, in Switzerland, we have the only one is here in Zurich right now. Yeah. And the idea from Jean Pierre was to perform a trial like um, Prodigion. Yeah. The Papillon. Yeah. yeah. It's a good idea, but you know, I mean, one of the things that we have to keep in mind, and I say that in all my talks, that, you know, there is more to more than organ preservation in rectal cancer. I mean, you know, we, we have to address the issue of the, as I say, you know, um, female, young females that they want to have, you know, children, the fertility issues, sexual dysfunctions and, and, and other issues. And we have to take all into consideration. And for example, for open rectal cancer, we use different approach and the emphasis, it might not be in organ preservation. So, you know, we have to keep that in mind, but, but definitely I think um, if you want to escalate, I think, that machine might be one of the ways to do it. Thank you. One last question, perhaps uh, regarding quality of life. Uh, you know, we often see those patients coming back after surgery and, and sometimes we see them in the follow-up and then they complain about urgency, running to the toilet in the morning several times and not being able to participate in social life as previously. 
do you really have the impression that with organ preservation, after such an intensive uh, total knee ointment therapy, patients have really a much substantially better quality of life? Uh, yeah, the, the, the short answer is yes. I mean, when you talk to the patient who had, um, you know, watch and wait and preserve the rectum long term, uh, the bowel function and quality of life is quite good. Um, honestly, the, the most common complaint that they get from those patients is neuropathy from the oxaliplatin. That probably is the most common complaint. The problem that we have is that the tool that we use to assess quality of life and bowel function in rectal cancer, they are not designed for patients who don't have surgery. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a problem. We, we, of course, we are collecting, we collected quality of life data in the OPRA trial. We have also published from patients outside of the trial. The, the, the promise of, you know, um, preserve quality of life with organ preservation, I think is there, it has been met. The only issue is by taking this approach, do we over treat some patients that at the end of the day, they end up getting chemotherapy, radiation and surgery because they don't respond. That is the question. Maybe some of those patients might have skipped one of the three components of the treatment. You know what I mean? Might have skipped radiation, might have skipped chemotherapy. He would have gone for surgery first. That is the main question. But the patient who have um, clinical complete response and they don't require even a local excision, just you know, observation. The quality of life is quite good. It's, it's even better because we don't. Many of them they don't get radiation or the sphincter, and also the dose is not as high as anal cancer. They have a much better quality of life, in my opinion, than patients treated with uh, definitive chemo radiation for anal cancer. Thank you, thank you very much. I think this is really uh, an innovative uh, way to go forward and. I'm very curious to see how this technique now of organ preservation is taken on by the world community in different parts of the world and how this is now slowly changing. For you, it might be normal. For us, it's not. And uh, it is perhaps also in the US not very common, as you just described previously, that patients are blocking to your institute because you promote this. But I'm really curious now to see how this is changing the community worldwide. Yeah. yeah, I think there is a question. Somebody has the hand yeah. raised, Michael. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for your talk. It's a pleasure to have us uh, with you. I have, I have two questions, which are three questions, which, which are probably related. So A is, um, how confident are we that the, that the sequence matters? So radiotherapy first or chemo radiotherapy first, followed by chemo or the other way around? Um, and I ask this question because it's, to me, it's quite counterintuitive to say radiotherapy first is, is, looks better. And, and related is, do you think that with, with another type of chemo, a more intense chemotherapy, uh, now I think of, uh, folfiorine or folfoxiri type of chemotherapy as the French have used it, this would have changed. And with that, would we have maybe improve the results for the poor responders and and related with this i mean or is this just massive over treatment for the majority of the patients um what are your thoughts and do you have any other is there is there still a collection of bio samples like uh, circulating tumor dna which might help with this with a further and future analysis yeah well, I can answer those questions. The, the idea of starting radiation first, um, mm -hmm. that was a debate that we had when we started the trial. In fact, the, the evidence suggested that radiation first was probably more effective and it had happened in other cancers. For example, in anal cancer, there was a trial in which we started with chemotherapy and was detrimental. Um, there have been biological principles that particularly coming from the radiation oncologists that with chemotherapy, you might select clones now, also looking and understanding a little bit what we are starting to see of the response, which is probably not so much direct effect of the treatment as mm -hmm. uh, the interaction between the tumor and the tumor microenvironment is not, is not um, counterintuitive. I think it probably suggests that radiation is acting through a mechanism that um, harnesses more the tumor microenvironment that chemotherapy does. So again, the results, the, re, the secondary aim, which was compared to ARMS, there was hypothesis and there were numbers based in previous experience and it confirms that finding. The German trial, the CAO-12 confirmed the same thing. Why? We still don't have an explanation. Now, in regarding the escalation, yes, there is a trial in the United States that is going to do that. It's going to 
uh, get consolid uh, chemo radiation consolidation with Folfox versus Folfirinox. So they're going to escalate the chemotherapy. We will have an answer for that. Um, the third question about overtreatment, of course. The whole idea, I think we overtreat rectal cancer. I mean, of the three components, we have surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. We wanted to de-escalate. That's what we did with, with surgery. Surgery was the main culprit of the morbidity. And that's what we did, de-escalate the treatment and just take the surgery out of the equation for half of the patients. Now, in other tumors, in other locations in the rectum that they are probably where organ preservation is not so important, maybe we can de-escalate with the, you know, getting rid of radiation such as the a prospect trial that will Perfect. be published this year. And, and so, and, you know, we also collected the specimens um, in, in the patients treated at our institution that was, you know, like a one fourth of the entire group of patients. We have um, uh, specimens and we are analyzing them and we have also CT DNA. Uh, but, you know, with 60 patients, we are not going to be able to say how predictive the CT DNA is or response or survival. Um, for the next trials, again, there is one in the United States that has been, is going to be approved and is going to open soon, comparing the double versus the triple chemotherapy. In that trial, they are also going to collect um, plasma for CT DNA and more correlative studies. So I think this is a, a field that is evolving and you know, we will get some more information hopefully soon. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay. Maybe one more uh, question. Uh, we had uh, one aspect in our population that uh, was uh, the, the fact that people had psychological problems having the watch and wait strategy and that people had problems with having so many follow-ups, having problems with the fact that uh, the tumor was treated but not removed and uh, the, uh, the fact that they... Uh, had in their follow-ups, uh, in the histology, dysplasias discovered. And uh, some patients in our population, they approached us and wanted surgery despite the cancer was not discovered. Uh, what is your experience in that aspect? Oh, we have a lot of patients that they are not interested. Um, you know, I think, uh, as I say before, when we present the treatment to the patients. Patient, I mean, we don't do watch and wait, which is paradoxical in patients with a stage one disease. Somebody who has a stage two, big stage two or a stage three tumor, these are the ones that we treat with TNT. And we tell them, you know, we treat you with the idea that you might need to have, you know, the standard, which is, you know, total neurological therapy and then surgery. And it's only after they have a clinical complete response that we raise the issue. We have some patients that they are not interested. There are some patients that they don't want that uncertainty. You, you just uh, say it very well. So we, we have similar patients in the United States. And, and we always emphasize the fact that, you know, we have follow up from eight or nine years in 10 years in the longest I've been doing this, but we don't know what is going to happen long term. So we still have to tell the patients that to some degree, this is promising, but there is still some uncertainties. And he, the patient is someone who is not able to deal with that, I think the patients are better off having surgery. Mm -hmm. The only thing that you have to emphasize is that even if you have surgery, there is a, a great degree of uncertainty because even after surgery, you have some risk of local recurrence and a very significant risk of distal metastasis. So it's a conversation that you need to have with the patient, but definitely we have many patients that they don't like the idea of uh, coming every four months to or three months to have a um, uh, you know, another exam and being always worried what is going to happen when I see the doctor. Are they going to tell me something bad? And uh, it's, it's very legitimate. And I think we have to, you know, emphasize that there are still some unknowns. Um, and, and I think patients need to understand that. Um, so uh, it's an important consideration. Thank you very much. So it's not for everyone. It needs to be discussed. Thank you very much. It's always good to discuss things, and it was great to discuss this with you tonight, or for us tonight, perhaps you for this lunchtime, but have a nice day. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Great talking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah. Bye now. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.